from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Organizations have considerable room to improve their performance without making expensive changes to their talent, their structure, or their fundamental business model. You don't need a slew of consultants to tell you what to do. You already know. What you need is to immediately ratchet up expectations, energy, urgency, and intensity. You have to fight mediocrity every step of the way, amp it up, and the results will follow. This is the fundamental premise of a hard-hitting new book written by Frank Slootman, CEO of Snowflake, and published earlier this year. It's called Amp It Up, Leading for Hypergrowth by Raising Expectations, Increasing Urgency, and Elevating Intensity. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. At Snowflake Summit last month, I was asked to interview Frank on stage about his new book. I've read it several times, and if you haven't read it, you should. Even if you have read it, in this breaking analysis, we'll dig deeper into the book and share some clarifying insights and nuances directly from Slootman himself from my one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. My first question to Slootman was, why do you write this book? Okay, it's a kind of a, a common throwaway question. And how the heck did you find time to do it? It's fairly well known that a few years ago, Slootman put up a post on links, LinkedIn with the title Amp It Up. It generated so much buzz and so many requests for Frank's time that he decided that the best way to efficiently scale and share his thoughts on how to create high-performing companies and organizations was to publish a book. Now, he wrote the book during the pandemic, and I joked that they must not have Netflix in Montana, where he resides. In a pretty funny moment, he said that writing the book was easier than promoting it. Take a listen. Denise, our, uh, our CMO, you know, she just made sure that this process wasn't going to... It was more, it was more work for me to promote this book with all these damn podcasts and, and all that crap. Now, the book gives a lot of interesting background information on Slootman's career and what he learned at various companies that he led and participated in. Now, I'm not going to go into most of that today, which is why you should read the book yourself. But Slootman, he's become somewhat of a business hero to many people, myself included. Leaders like Frank, Scott McNeely, Jay Shri Ulal, and my old boss, Pat McGovern at IDG have inspired me over the years. And each has applied his or her own approach to building cultures and companies. Now, when Slootman first took over the reins at Snowflake, I published a breaking analysis talking about Snowflake and what we could expect from the company now that Slootman and CFO Mike Scarpelli were back together. In that post, buried toward the end, I referenced the playbook that Frank used at Data Domain and ServiceNow, two companies that I followed quite closely as an analyst, and how it would be applied at Snowflake, that playbook, if you will. Frank reached out to me afterwards and said something to the effect of, I don't use playbooks. I'm a situational leader. Playbooks, you know, they work in football games, but in the military, they teach you situational leadership. Pretty interesting learning moment for me. So I asked Frank on the stage about this. Here's what he said. You know, the older you get, the more experience that you have, the more you become a prisoner of your own background because you sort of think in terms of what you know, as opposed to, you know, getting outside of what you know and trying to sort of look at things like a five-year-old that has never seen this before. And then how, how would you, you know, deal with this? And I really try to force myself into, I've never seen this before. And how do I think about it? Because at least they're very different, uh, you know, interpretations and be open-minded, just really avoid that rinse and repeat uh, mentality. And, you know, I've brought people in from, from that have worked with me before, some of them come with me from company to company, and they were falling prey to, you know, rinse and repeat. And I would just literally go like, it's not what we want. So think about that for a moment. I mean, imagine coming in to lead a new company and forcing yourself and your people to forget what they know that works and it has worked in the past. Put that aside and assess the current situation with an open mind. Essentially, start over. Now, that doesn't mean you don't apply what has worked in the past. Slootman talked to me about bringing back 
Scarpelli and the synergistic relationship that they have and how they build cultures and the no BS and hard truth mentality they bring to companies. But he bristles when people ask him, what type of CEO are you? He says, do we have to put a label on it? It really depends on the situation. Now, one of the other really hard hitting parts of the book was the way Frank deals with who to keep and who to let go. He uses the Volkswagen tagline of drivers wanted. He says in his book, in, in companies, there are passengers and are drivers. We want drivers. He said, you have to figure out really quickly who the drivers are and basically throw the wrong people off the bus. Keep the right people, bring in new people that fit the culture and put them in the right seats on the bus. Now, these are not easy decisions to make, but as it pertains to getting rid of people, I'm reminded of the movie Moneyball. Art Howe, the manager of the Oakland A's, he refused to play Scott Hatterberg at first base. So the GM, Billy Bean, played by Brad Pitt, says to Peter Brand, who was played by Jonah Hill, you have to fire Carlos Pena. Go learn how to fire people. Billy Bean says, just keep it quick. Tell him he's been traded and that's it. So I asked Frank, okay, I get it. Like the movie, when you have the wrong person on the bus, you just have to make the decision, be straightforward and do it. But I asked him, what if you're on the fence? What if you're not completely sure if this person is a driver or a passenger, if he or she should be on the bus or not on the bus? How do you handle that? Listen to what he said. I have a very simple way to break ties. And, uh, and when there's doubt, there's no doubt, okay? When there's doubt, there's no doubt. Slubin's philosophy is you have to be emphatic and have high conviction. You know, back to the baseball analogy, if you're thinking about taking the pitcher out of the game, take him out. Confrontation is the single hardest thing in business, according to Slootman, but you have to be intellectually honest and do what's best for the organization, period. Okay, so wow, that may sound harsh, but that's how Slootman approaches it. Very Belichickian, if you will. But how can you amp it up on a daily basis? What's the approach that Slootman takes? We got into this conversation with the discussion about MBOs, management by objective. Slootman in his, in his book says he's killed MBOs at every company he's led. And I asked him to explain why. His rationale was that individual MBOs invariably end up in a discussion about relief of the MBO if the person is not hitting his or her targets. And that detracts from the organizational alignment. He said at Snowflake, everyone gets paid the same way from the execs on down. It's a key way he creates focus and energy in an organization. By creating alignment, urgency, and putting more resources into the most important things. This is especially hard, Slootman says, as the organization gets bigger. But if you do approach it this way, everything gets easier. The cadence changes, the tempo accelerates, and it works. Now, and to emphasize that point, he said the following. Play the clip. Every meeting that you have, every email, every encounter in the hallway, whatever it is, is an opportunity to end things up. That's why I use that title. But do you take that opportunity? And according to Slootman, if you don't take that opportunity, if you're not in the moment amping it up, then you're thinking about your golf game or the tennis match or <laughs> that's going on this weekend or being out in your boat. And to the point, this approach is not for everyone. You're either built for it or you're not. But if you can bring people into the organization that can handle this type of dynamic, it creates energy, it becomes fun, everything moves faster. The conversations are exciting, they're inspiring, and it becomes addictive. Now let's talk about priorities. I said to Frank that for me anyway, his book was an uncomfortable read, and he was somewhat surprised by that. Really? He said. I said, yeah. I mean, it was an easy read, but uncomfortable because over my career, I've managed thousands of people, not tens of thousands, but thousands, enough to have to take this stuff very seriously. And I found myself throughout the book, you know, on the one hand saying to myself, oh, I got that right. Good job, Dave. And then other times I was thinking to myself, oh, oh, wow, I probably need to rethink that. I need to amp it up on that front. And the point is, to Frank's leadership philosophy, 
there's no one correct way to approach all situations. You have to figure it out for yourself. But the one thing in the book that I found the hardest was Slootman challenged the reader. If you had to drop everything and focus on one thing, just one thing for the rest of the year, what would that one thing be? Think about that for a moment. Were you able to come up with that one thing? What would happen to all the other things on your priority list? Are they all necessary? If so, how would you delegate those? Do you have someone in your organization who could take those off your plate? What would happen if you only focused on that one thing? These are hard questions, but Slootman really forces you to think about them and do that mental exercise. Look at Frank's body language in this screenshot. Imagine going into a management meeting with Frank and being prepared to share all the things you're working on that you're so proud of and all the priorities you have for the coming year. Listen to Frank in this clip and tell me it doesn't really make you think. I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm on other boards and stuff and I, I get the PowerPoint slide from the CEO and there's like 15 things. There are priorities for you. I'm like, you have 15, you got none, right? Um, it's like you just can't decide, you know, what's important. So I'll, I'll tell you everything because I just, I just can't figure out. And the thing is, uh, it's very hard to just say one thing, but it's really the mental exercise that matters. Going through that mental exercise is really important, according to Slootman. Let's have a conversation about what really matters at this point in time. Why does it need to happen? And does it take priority over other things? Slootman says you have to pull apart the hairball and drive extraordinary clarity. You could be wrong, he says, and he admits he's been wrong on many things before. He, like everyone, is fearful of being wrong. But if you don't have the conversation, according to Slootman, you're already defeated. And one of the most important things Slootman emphasizes in the book is execution. He said that's one of the reasons he wrote Amp It Up. In our discussion, he referenced Pat Gelsinger, his former boss, who bought Data Domain when he was working for Joe Tucci at EMC. Listen to Frank describe the interaction with Gelsinger. My, uh, one of my uh, prior bosses, uh, you know, Pat Gelsinger, when uh, they acquired Data Domain through EMC, Pat's now the CEO of Intel. And uh, he quoted Andy Grove as saying, because he was at Intel for a long time before he was a younger man, and he said, no strategy is better than his execution. I find one of the most brilliant now, before you go changing your strategy, says Lubman, you have to eliminate execution as a potential point of failure. All too often, he says, Silicon Valley wants to change strategy without really understanding whether the execution is right. All too often, companies don't consider that maybe the product isn't that great. They will frequently for example, make a change to sales leadership without questioning whether or not there's a product fit. According to Slootman, you have to drive hardcore intellectual honesty. And as, as uncomfortable as that may be, it's incredibly important and powerful. Okay, one of the other contrarian points in the book was whether or not to have a customer success department. Slootman says this became really fashionable in Silicon Valley with the SaaS craze. Everyone was following and pattern matching the lead of Salesforce.com. He says he's eliminated the customer service department at every company he's led, which had a customer success department. Listen to Frank Slootman in his own words, talk about the customer success department. I view the whole company as a customer success function, okay? I'm customer success. You know, I, I said it in my presentation yesterday, we're a customer first organization. I don't need a department. Now, he went on to say that sales owns the commercial relationship with the customer. Engineering owns the technical relationship. And oh, by the way, he always puts support inside of the engineering department because engineering has to back up support. And rather than having a separate department for customer success, he focused on focuses on making sure that the existing departments are functioning properly. Slootman also has always been a big, has always been big on net promoter score, NPS. 
And Snowflakes is very high at 72. And according to Slootman, it's not just the product, it's the people that drive that type of loyalty. Now, Slootman stresses amping up the big things and even the little things too. He told a story about someone who came into his office to ask his opinion about a t-shirt. And he turned it around on her and said, well, what do you think? And she said, well, it's okay. So Frank made the point by flipping the situation. Why are you coming to me with something that's just okay? If we're gonna do something, let's do it. Let's do it all out. Let's do it right and get excited about it. Not just check the box and get something off your desk. Amp it up, all aspects of our business. Listen to Slootman talk about Steve Jobs and the relevance of demanding excellence and shunning mediocrity. He was incredibly tolerant of anything that didn't, where he didn't think it was great. You know, he, he was immediately done with it and with the person. You know, I'm not that aggressive, you know, uh, in, in, in that way. I'm, I'm a little bit nicer, you know, about it, but I still, you know, I don't want to give in to expediency and, and mediocrity. I just don't. I'm just going to fight it, you know, every, every step of the way. Now, that story was about a little thing, like some swag. But Slootman talked about some big things, too. And one of the major ways Snowflake was making big, sweeping changes to amp up its business was reorganizing its go-to-market around industries like financial services, media, and healthcare. Here's some ETR data that shows Snowflake's net score or spending momentum for key industry segments over time. The red dotted line at 40% is an indicator of highly elevated spending momentum. And you can see for the key areas shown, Snowflake is well above that level. And we cut this data where responses, responses were greater, the response numbers were greater than 15. So not huge ends, but large enough to have meaning. Most were in the 20s. Now it's relatively uncommon to see a company that's having the success of Snowflake make this kind of non-trivial change in the middle of steep S-curve growth. Why did they make this move? Well, I think it's because Snowflake realizes that its data cloud is going to increasingly have industry diversity and unique value by industry, that ecosystems and data marketplaces are forming around industries. So the more industry affinity Snowflake can create, the stronger its moat will be. It also aligns with how the largest and most prominent global system integrators, global SIs, go to market. This is important because as companies are transforming, they are radically changing their data architecture, how they think about data, how they approach data as a competitive advantage. And they're looking at data as specifically a monetization opportunity. So having industry expertise and knowledge and aligning with those customer objectives is going to serve Snowflake and its ecosystems well, in my view. Slootman even said he joined the board of Instacart, not because he needed another board seat, because, but because he wanted to get out of his comfort zone and expose himself to other industries as a way to learn. So look, we're just barely scratching the surface of Slootman's book. And I've pulled some highlights from our conversation. There's so much more that I can share just even from our conversation. And I will as the opportunity arises. But for now, I'll just give you the kind of bumper sticker of Ramp It Up. Raise your standards by taking every opportunity, every interaction to increase your intensity. Get your people aligned and moving in the same direction. If it's the wrong direction, figure it out and course correct quickly. Prioritize and sharpen your focus on things that will really make a difference. If you do these things and increase the urgency in your organization, you'll naturally pick up the pace and accelerate your company. Do these things and you'll be able to transform better identify adjacent opportunities and go attack them and create a lasting and meaningful experience for your employees, customers, and partners. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. And thank you to Alex Meyerson, who's on production and he manages the podcast for Breaking Analysis. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at SiliconANGLE who does some Wonderful and tremendous editing. Thank you all. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcasts. I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. And you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on my LinkedIn posts. And please do check out etr.ai for the best survey data 
in enterprise tech. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching. Be well. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.